Hello, welcome to Remember the Film, the podcast where one of our generals, he had a sort of, well, he went a little funny in the head. You know, funny. And he did a silly thing. Uh, we're that podcast. Uh, we're that my name's podcast. Josh Bradley. <laughs> my name's Josh Bradley. I'm joined by one of my co-hosts, Jeff Grizz Ulrich. How are you, Jeff? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good, man. But we're also joined by our other co-host, Hugo Panay. How are you, Hugo? Doing great, but but also you should have gone through the whole monologue. I'm sorry, Dimitri. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry Dimitri. Dimitri. I'm just as capable of being sorry as you are, Dimitri. Don't say that you're <laughs> more just sorry as than sorry I as am. You are, Dimitri. <laughs> well, let me finish, Dimitri. Let me finish, Dimitri. That's a. I, I'm pretty sure Peter Sellers ad libbed that. That's completely or at least most improv'd. of that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's honestly one of the funniest parts of the movie. Uh, if you could not yeah. tell, based on our quotes just now, we were talking today about. Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Love the longest bomb. title so far for a film to remember, I'm pretty <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, well, easily. Pretty sure, yeah. <laughs> Probably it's the a... longest one we'll ever have. <laughs> yes. We should do, what's another one that could come close? Maybe Birdman? The Birdman unexpected... or The Unexpected Virtue of Ignorance, which I don't it's like that still shorter. It's still shorter. It's still shorter. Yes. yes. Try harder. Uh, before, man. yeah, there you go. Before we get too far into Dr. Strange. I want to ask you guys about Stanley Kubrick real, real quick. Um, mm-hmm. I don't really have this on the outline. I just wanted to know like how you came to him and like, what are the Kubrickist movies for you? Hmm. Chris, do you want to start? I'll go ahead and kick it off. So yeah, I started watching Kubrick movies because I want to watch classic movies and it wasn't out mm-hmm. of a desire particularly to watch those movies, but because I want to, you know, have, seen all the important movies of history right and i'm nowhere near done with that obviously but uh so that's what that's what got me into watching some kubrick films uh i i really feel like there's two kubricks in in my mind there's the one that does movies like dr strangelove and paths of glory and you know even full metal jacket to to some extent and then there's kubrick who gets a little weird <laughs> and he yeah, did he 2001 does. and he did clockwork orange and yes. I definitely like normal Kubrick better. <laughs> normal Kubrick. This is, so this is normal Kubrick. This is normal Kubrick. This is the, okay. this is the kind of like in the sense that I think Hugo's normal, and this is the kind of movie Hugo would make. <laughs> <laughs> sure, Hugo. What do you think about that? The, the kind of movie you would make. Interesting. <laughs> no. Oh, the kind of movie I would make would be way more insane than this. Uh, give me all the insanity the, and the weirdness, please. Um, What's your Kubrick history, Hugo? I I love Kubrick. Uh, I think the first movie of his I watched was uh, Full Metal Jacket. I think because I watched it with my dad or something. Mm-hmm. It's one of those that I watched way too early, but uh, it was hilarious for us because we, we had a lot of fun just making fun of the whole first hour half. And yes. I I I remember like I don't I didn't remember the second half of the movie after that first watch, I just remembered the first time and I thought it was a hilarious comedy because uh, I was a child and I didn't understand <laughs> the uh, implications of what the movie was trying to say. It's kind of funny. It's, it's really it's, funny. Yeah, it is really funny. It's just that, especially if you don't know what the movie's getting at, it can be really funny. Yeah. Um, but also in general, I think all Kubrick's films have this really dark, uh, twisted sense of humor that I enjoy. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I've seen, I've seen nine of his movies, uh, the ones I haven't seen are Lolita and uh, I think, well, Fear and Desire and the yeah, first thing, those, few things that he made. But, things he made, I haven't seen um, I think every everything that I've seen from him is absolutely fantastic, and it, the, the the level of variety that even though you can always tell it's him to some extent, just because of how meticulously everything is shot and edited, and there's also something in the acting that he gets out of his actors where it. I don't know. I don't know if I would call it overacting, but it it feels theatrical quite often. It's not as naturalistic as other directors. Uh, Funny you would mention be. that because George C. Scott, uh, when asked about this movie, uh, mm. said that he believed that he was overacting and he didn't he didn't like doing that. But Kubrick kept right. telling him, "No, no go bigger, yeah. go bigger." Yes, and then I, I ap- think he after seeing he it definitely enjoys that. Years later, he's like, "You know what." This might be my best work. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, what I read on that topic is that George C. Scott was doing those big over-the-top takes because Kubrick told him they were only practice and they wouldn't actually end up in the finished movie. Yeah. And then he used them in the finished oh, movie. Okay. And George C. Scott, like, George C. Scott didn't work with Kubrick again after this, ostensibly because of that. But, like, 
he also may have acknowledged later that it was one of his better performances. I think it is. And yeah, so I I think the level of variety of genres that he's able that he's been able to tackle is extremely impressive. I think there are very few directors who have gone into different types of films and different genres and made something so successful in that genre. Like he's made one of the best costume dramas, one of the best science fiction space movies, three of the best war movies. He's made one of the best horror movies of all time. And it, I think that's just really impressive. And there is something intangible about his work that just draws me in and that I really appreciate. I, I don't exactly know how to explain it, but he just puts you into a world in a way that very few directors, I think, can do. Stuff's very compelling. That's, you know, yeah. one way to put it, I guess. Uh, what's what's the Kubrickist movie for you? Because, like, I kind of agree with Grizz. He's got a very, I mean, you just yeah. said, too, he's got a very wide spectrum of, of stuff. Mm-hmm. So what I is think it for you, you think? most of what he's made is is very much something that you, it, it would be hard to attribute mm-hmm. to anyone else. Uh, yeah, I agree, I agree with Grizz that maybe that path, path, of, path of Glory and even The Killing, if you've seen that one, are uh, movies that, feel a little more traditional just because they were made in a period of his life that was early in his career so he wasn't maybe experimenting as much but i think after that everything is very unique and very very kubrick and and i really could not see anyone else directing the same movies yeah so i don't know can you say that 2001 is more kubrick than the shining or full metal jacket i was going to say 2001 and my reason is it is multifaceted for that it's that mm-hmm. 2001 it, Kubrick like we were talking about goes hard in every facet of the movie right like yes. he's gonna the production design for 2001 is you know is textbook like that's literally the movie that they used to teach production design so <laughs> it's also like they they did stuff in that movie that no movie had done unprecedented at that point. yeah like, and, and that's the sort of stuff that Kubrick ridiculous. does when he's making movies like you said you were talking about how meticulous mm-hmm. he is uh, that is, yeah. I think that comes across the most in 2001, but also Kubrick, uh, you know, is, he, he's a little funny as we said in our, our quote <laughs> yeah. at the top and 2001 has a lot of those really like, you know, uh, psychological, philosophical things Musings. to it. And, and, uh, you know, uh, for me, that's why I, I don't love that one as much cause it gets too weird. And like, it, you know, mm-hmm. I always feel like it's telling me like, you get it, right? You get it? Like, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. He's up. <laughs> yeah. But, have uh, you guys seen Eyes Wide Shut? I have not seen Eyes Wide Shut. I was going to ask about that, too. I, I have not, but I think that I think the anniversary was this past week of the yeah. release of the movie. So, like, I've seen a bunch of, like, screenshots on film Twitter the last week or so, but I have not actually seen it. I, I think that's worth revisiting because it's, like, it's, it's different from other Kubrick films, but at the same time, it's so weird and it, it it it's hard to explain why that movie i think is great but i think it's one of the underappreciated movies that he made because it's like is a tail end of his career is less critically su- successful at the time of release even though most of his movies are less critically successful at the time of the release than they are when they get revaluated after a while um but i think that one is is one that that you guys should watch it's like this weird like sexual thriller psychological thing and I, I think it's really good right well i think the reception at the time of release may have been muddled by the fact that it was like two very famous people who were married to each yes. other and like were all over the tabloids for the past decade so like and they're also their marriage was in the process of ending i think at the time yeah. so like that may have kind of muddled reception in the movie but i i agree that it's kind of been reassessed in the last you know 20 plus mm-hmm. years and uh i really do need to get to it i actually learned this week when I watched Dr. Strangelove, it's like uh, HBO Max has most of Kubrick's movies because yeah. most of his movies were, w- were Warner Brothers. So mm-hmm. uh, most of them are up there. I haven't seen Lolita or uh, I also haven't seen Barry Lyndon. But yeah, I mean, um, I have. yeah, his movie, his, like like you guys said, his movies are incredible. And he's you know, got yeah. maybe the most one of the most important directors of the last 50 years. Um, Which one is your Kubrickiest? Well, I was going to say that I, I think I first came to him through 2001 and A Clockwork Orange because like, you know, when you're discovering movies those are two movies that come up i think pretty early on and like the the canon uh yep. when you're like first discovering the canon and so when i learned that the same dude made those two movies i'm like oh okay i need to learn this guy's name i guess mm-hmm. um but it's funny hugo now that you mentioned full metal jacket uh my dad actually showed me and my brother the uh intro scene to that when i was like 11 or 12 because my dad was a U- was a u.s marine and mm. he says that full metal jacket is like the most accurate depiction of boot camp he's ever seen in a movie. 
So he wanted to show us to it, show us it for that reason, probably forgetting how much cursing there is. Yeah. Because that's yeah. not a movie you want to show eleven year old. Um, but still, so I, I saw the first like two minutes of Full Metal Jacket long before I knew who Stanley Kubrick was, but. Um, I've since come back to it, and I, I really love Full Metal Jacket. It's a good one. The face yeah. Vincent D'Onofrio makes in that pivotal moment that we're not—I'm not, not going to spoil the movie—but there's the big moment yeah. uh, in the first half of the movie, yeah. and that face Vincent D'Onofrio makes is scarier than basically any horror movie. <laughs> Spine tingling. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, yeah, it's what they call the Kubrick stare. Yeah, it is. Yeah, there's quite a few scenes in his movies where he uses that shot. I came to The Shining pretty late, and I've only seen The Shining a couple times, so like. Uh, I, I've seen *The Clockwork Orange* and *Full Metal Jacket* in 2001 and *Doctor Strange Love* a lot, and I have not. And I've seen *The Shining* a few times, not that much, but like, there are parts of *Full Metal Jacket* that are as scary as *The Shining*. I oh think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's and also there's like existential horror in in a lot of his movies, like kind of hidden in there, if you're willing to to see it. That's actually what I think is why *A Clockwork Orange* in 2001 kind of like are talked about maybe more, uh, mm -hmm. at least among certain people. And that's because, like, they are a lot to take in on their surface, on the face, but there's also a lot to dig into in both of those. And in, in all of his movies, like you just said. Um, including Dr. Strangelove. Can we get into Dr. Strangelove? I'd Anything love else that. Kubrick? I'd love that. Let's talk about right. Strangelove. Uh, Dr. Strangelove, boilerplate stuff. It was released on January 29th, 29th 1964, on a budget of $1.8 million, and... All the box office data I could find was the North American box office, which was 9.4 million. So 1.8 budget, 9.4 box office. At least, I don't know if it was not released internationally or what, but that's what I found. It was produced and directed by Stanley Kubrick from a screenplay by Kubrick, Peter George, and Terry Southern, adapted from the novel Red Alert by Peter George. Uh, so the novelist had a screenplay credit. And it was nominated for four Oscars, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Screenplay Based on Material from Another Medium, so Best Adapted Screenplay, and uh, Best Actor for Peter Sellers. Notably, Ken Adams' production design was not nominated, which I am just furious over. I just learned that this week, and I about threw my phone across the room. Um, <laughs> so a couple things about Ken Adams' production design. Number one, they the, the B-52 set, he, he designed that just based on like a couple of photos they had of a B-52 cockpit. And apparently his set was so good and so true to life that the U.S. Air Force, like, questioned the filmmakers about how they were able to get it so accurate. They because thought they were like... spying for the Russians. Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then also the, um, the War Room set, uh, Steven Spielberg called it the greatest set ever designed. Mm -hmm. And um, a couple things about the War Room set, the uh, table they're sitting at, you can't see it in the black and white, but it's got green felt on it as if it were a poker table. Mm -hmm. which I thought was a very interesting choice given what happens in the war room. And also um, the lighting above the table looks like a mushroom cloud. And that was pointed out to me this week by past and future guest in front of the show, TJ Keeley. And so like the direction of the design is great. It's, it's, you know, as Steven Spielberg said, some of the best, best ever. And like it didn't, even, did not even get nominated for an Oscar, which just upset me when I learned that this week. It, uh, production design is one thing that I think all of Kubrick's films are so meticulously perfect at like the level of detail and precision and you can tell everything that's being shown on screen has has had a thought process behind it and it, i think it's really impressive the whole scene where they he's just going through the plane and he shows these still shots of all the knobs and things and all the technical equipment and i, I think that stuff is absolutely brilliant yeah you know his, his stanley kubrick's only oscar win in his career was for visual effects on 2001 and yeah. you know the director of the movie was was also in charge of visual effects, but uh, mm -hmm. the visual effects and the production design in two thousand one are kind of it kind of yeah. merged. Like they use a lot of practical effects, so like a lot of it is production design for the visual effects. So that's that's mm -hmm. a really good point, Hugo. Um, I wanted to point out the stacked best actor category at the nineteen sixty five Oscars. Yeah, who all was in that? So, so I'm going to talk more about Peter Sellers later in this movie because it's it's unbelievable what he's doing. But uh, so we had Peter Sellers for Doctor Strangelove. Anthony Quinn for Zorba the Greek, Peter O'Toole for Beckett, Richard Burton for Beckett, and then the winner was uh, Rex Harrison for a movie that I don't want to spoil yet, but like, Jesus Christ, Richard Burton, Peter O'Toole, Anthony Quinn, and Peter Sellers lost the best actor that year. Um, well, we talked, okay, about, so we talked about Peter O'Toole during our Lawrence of Arabia you know, thing. We he did. got passed over yes, a did. lot for the Oscars. He did, yes. <laughs> But, um, so, so like I said, Strays Love was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Screenplay based on another medium. Uh, it lost 
all four Oscars was nominated for. What was the big Oscar winner at the 65 ceremony? Do you guys remember? You know I'm not going to know the answer to this. I have. I'm just curious. Just curious. <laughs> no clue. So the two uh, big movies of the night, the two big movies of the night, the one with the most wins was My Fair Lady. That's what beat Rex Doctor Strange Love. And, I, that's what I thought. Rex Harrison, exactly. Uh, Henry Higgins. So that one picture director and best actor. And then uh, the uh, most nominated for movie for the night and the second most wins was uh, Mary Poppins. Mary Poppins. Mary so the, the Poppins. Two, the, two, the two big <laughs> movies were My Fair Lady and Mary Poppins. Um, Which are, of course, great because it's two movies with really horrendous British accents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think those, I mean, I actually I haven't seen either one of those movies, to be honest, but, you know, I, I know that they're both still beloved, but I think that maybe, maybe this is my own, my own bias because I love Dr. Strangelove, but I think history has bore out that Strangelove is the more important movie from 1964, oh, yeah. more so than My Fair Lady or Mary Poppins. I, I, mean, I mean, it depends on the... the Depends the discussion you that you're having, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. Mary Poppins is incredibly important uh, in terms of Disney history and Disney being so yeah. prevalent. Mary Poppins, therefore, is very important. But uh, yeah, I think it was actually I think it might have been the only Best Picture nomination for Walt Disney while he was still alive. I think I think I read that. But but uh, in awesome. any case, you know, so you can make it. I can see you make an argument for that. Of course, My Fair Lady uh, has been imped and redone a thousand different ways in TV shows and movies. It's based on a play from like the 19, exactly. 1913, I think. So yeah. it's, again, very important. But in terms of cinema history, I do think that Dr. Strangelove, for for movie fans, Dr. Strangelove yeah. is the one that is more relevant. Right. And so it, on that note, I have some data to possibly back up that claim that Dr. Strangelove is most important, at least from a film perspective. Um, it was among the, 25, the first 25 films that the Library of Congress selected for preservation in the inaugural class of the National Film Registry. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the National Film Registry, but uh, every year since 1989, uh, they select movies that they deem, quote, culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. For preservation, it's it's a film preservation kind of thing, but it's like a f- movies that are worth preserving that are voted on and stuff. Um, and so, 1989 was the first year they did this, and so they had uh, the, the criteria is has to be an American movie, I think, and it has to be um, at least 10 years old. So, in 1989, they had the inaugural class. They basically had 80 years of movie history to choose from, and they can they only have they have up to 25 selections a year. So the First class, 1989, was which 25 movies of the first 80 years of the history of movies are worth preserving, and Dr. Strangelove was one of those 25, which I think is... um, Very impressive. Very impressive and speaks to how important Mm -hmm. this movie is. Um, Especially because, like, I was looking at, like, what got in in 1989 and, like, what didn't get into, like, 1990 or 1991. Uh, And you guys want to hear the 1989 inaugural class? It's nuts, Yeah. These were the 25 movies that were the inaugural preservation uh, National Film Registry. Uh, Best Years of Our Lives, Casablanca, Citizen Kane, The Crowd, Dr. Strangelove, The General, Gone with the Wind, The Grapes of Wrath, High Noon, Intolerance, The Learning Tree, Maltese Falcon, Modern Times, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, Nanook of the North, On the Waterfront, The Searchers, Singing in the Rain, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Some Like It Hot, Star Wars, Sunrise, uh, Sunrise, Sunset Boulevard, Vertigo, and The Wizard of Oz. So, Fun fact, the only place where you can actually find the original Star Wars. Really? George yes, Lucas modified the, the actual film when he did yes. the, the new editions. In in the film registry, they have the original original version of the film, because that's the film they wanted to preserve, the one that came out in theaters <laughs> in 1977. Yeah. And then it's gone. So it's there. And nobody will ever see it, I guess. <laughs> well, you can thank the National Film Registry for preserving that before yeah. Lucas could get his hands on it and, you know, do whatever he does. I, um, I love George, but... <laughs> also, uh, you know, I've cited the AFI Top 100 before. Uh, Dr. Strangelove was number 26 on the 1998 list, and then it dropped to number 39 on the 2007 list. And for the record, I don't think My Fair Lady was on either list. No, Mary Poppins was on either list. My Fair Lady was like number 90 on the 98 list and then fell off for the 2007 list. So just going off AFI, Dr. Strange Love mm. is the best of those three big movies from, from 60, 64. Um, also AFI has a top 100 funniest movies list of all time from, from 2000s. So it's kind of old at this point, but uh, Dr. Strange Love was number three 
behind mm. us, behind Some Like It Hot and Tootsie, just ahead of Annie Hall, Duck Soup, and Blazing Saddles. Um, okay. I'm cool with that. I think this movie is hysterical, personally. I don't know. I, don't know about you. I do think this movie is very funny, but I, I find it yeah. that it's not like laugh out loud funny most of the time. Most of the time, I think it is actually. I mean, no. I, I laugh out loud at a lot of it, but I, I, there, but I see I, your point. I don't think it's. I don't think it's a better example of comedy than Blazing Saddles. Or <laughs> it's it's a different thing. It's a different kind it's of comedy, different. I guess. Yeah, it's it's, very different. it's more uh, satire and parody than yeah. it is just comedy. But I think it's hilarious, especially like the first time that I watched it, I also found like, I think the commentary is what sticks out the most, but watching it a few times over, it it, it certainly, it becomes funnier and funnier because you start noticing the individual lines, you start seeing like the signs, freedom is our, no, peace is our profession in the army base and that kind of thing. That is just really funny. Did you see what uh, Churchinson's binder is labeled at his seat in the war room? With the label is no, binder, binder. Uh, targets and Megadeth. I'm pretty sure <laughs> is the uh, it's what's on his binder. Um, okay, so Hugo, you were just kind of going into like your personal history of the movie, where you said you used to think one thing about it, now you think a different thing about it. But I, I want to know what you what how, you know when you guys saw this for the first time, and uh, you mm-hmm. know what your history of this movie is, if you have one. Yeah, I only saw it first time uh, a few years ago. I. For some reason, I I hadn't gotten around to it yet. Um, yeah, I saw I, I did, saw a letterbox I saw a letterbox review from like 2019. I want to say. Yeah. So yeah, exactly a few years ago, and I I mean I had seen it at, when I was younger, but I did not remember much of it, and I also I would seen it in Italian on TV with ads or whatever, so it, it's not really the same experience. Um, the first time, as I said, I think what stuck out to me the first time was very much the, the the commentary and the satire, but the comedy didn't really get me that time. Watching it again, though, I started noticing all the little details that are really hilarious, like all the lines, all the all the names are a little reference, uh, the the movements that the characters make, uh, the, even just the faces uh, that some of the characters make during uh, dur- during scenes are just so hilarious, and even all the uh, the monologuing about the water and, you know, why I only drink distilled water. <laughs> it's like all that stuff the second time around is much funnier to me. So this time I, you know, I gave it a five star rating on, on Letterbox now. Cause I, I think it's, it's both a uh, comedic genius and one of the most poignant uh, political satires of, of, I don't know, of the century of cinema in general. So I, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. Personally, I completely agree. But I don't yeah. hear what, what Grizz has to say. Grizz, is, was this the first time you've seen this? This is the first time I've seen it all the way through. Okay. In high school, okay. in my world history class, uh, we had a day where we, we, we the teacher you know, said, okay, we're going to watch Dr. Strangelove. Uh, and we watched the, the class. The class was only 55 minutes. So, like, obviously we couldn't watch it all in one <laughs> sitting. So we watched the first half. And she said, we'll finish it next week. And we never finished it. So <laughs> <laughs> no. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible. So, I'd only seen the first half, and uh, so this is the first time I got to see it all the way through. I agree with a lot of what Hugo's saying. I I loved it. It, it like we we were talking about. It, it is very funny, and uh, I was my. Well, I guess we're we're gonna get to it here in a second. Our tweet length uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. I share mine now. Yeah, give me give me your tweet length review of I the mean, movie. My, yeah, <laughs> my tweet length review was uh, I can't I I can't decide if it's cool how relevant this movie still is today or sad <laughs> uh, i say sad but also sad. like it makes the movie yeah. better so <laughs> it's like yeah. the movie is better because of how relevant it is but it's also really yes. sad that this movie is still this relevant <laughs> yeah i actually uh i i don't really write letterbox reviews very much but i felt compelled uh, on this most rewatch and i think i i'm paraphrasing myself at something on the lines of like as our politicians get more and more cartoonish in real life Doctor Strangelove somehow gets like less and less funny, but also more funny. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Like it's, yeah, it's tough. Uh, <laughs> real quick, I, Hugo, I want to get your brief tweet length review of the movie. But before I do that, Grizz, I want to ask. Uh, so you saw, saw the first half like 15 years ago. How yeah. does it compare? Like, how's the payoff compare oh, 15 years after better. the setup? <laughs> okay, <laughs> like That's watching cool. it the first time, I was like, you know, the, the I didn't at the time I wasn't a huge movie buff, so like I I had heard of Doctor Strangelove, but I didn't know how important it was. I didn't know what kind of movie it was. And the teacher right. didn't bother telling us. She's just like, you know, we're watching Dr. Strangelove today, press play. And so like, I yeah, didn't know yeah. what I was watching. And especially in the first half of the movie, it's not entirely clear 
that Correct. it's satire until a pretty yes. good ways into the movies. <laughs> yes. So I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. this is kind of boring. It is, <laughs> it is definitely the kind of movie that kind of needs some sort of introduction. Um, you like you want to go into the movie no, kind of knowing what it is, what it's trying to be, and then you can really get wrapped up in it and and and, and understand why it's funny and why it's poignant. And poignant. Be, be looking um, for those things, like you said, like the, yeah. the funny signs and things, like these exactly. are you know our purpose, whatever it was. Uh, well, I, I also think that like. You know, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but I think you needed to kind of know what was going on in the world in 1964 yes. to like really fully appreciate how freaking bold this movie is, and therefore, oh yeah, how fun it is. You know, like what happens in this movie was like a very, a very real possibility of happening in real life for many decades. That's why the the opening tele card has to basically be a disclaimer from the Air Force saying, "Hey, don't worry, this can't happen," even it, though it like came close to happening a few times. You know, it's also a period in American history where. Drawing a line between uh, the American military and the American political system and the Russian military and political system and kind of putting them on par and saying, oh, these we are leaving our lives to people who might not be as competent as we think we are and poking fun at them and criticizing them in the 60s is something that is not as easy as it would be today. So like yeah, today absolutely. you can do parody at that level. At the time, in a Cold War period, it, criticizing the American side in a movie where the Russians are also in it and both of them are kind of horrible and, and stupid and ridiculous um, is is very bold. Yeah, I, I didn't think about that till just now, but what you are just saying kind of made me think about how much, you know, not to go down this rabbit hole, but like, Currently, the Department of Defense pays an awful lot of money to certain studios to, like, present the military a certain mm-hmm. way in their movies. So, like, yeah. a movie treating the U.S. government and military this way is very different from anything you would see nowadays, particularly from a major studio. So that's, that's an sure. interesting point. Well, and we're still, yeah. like, in terms of the actual history, this movie came out fairly, in the grand scheme of things, very shortly after Joseph McCarthy yeah. had been, you know, rooting out communists all over yep. the country and many of which probably weren't actually communists and, you know, and things like yeah. yes. the second red scare and all that. Right. So, you know, this was incredibly bold because mm-hmm. of how McCarthy and his supporters had gone after Hollywood, uh, you know, during that time. So the fact that, you know, coming off the heels of that and then doing a movie like this, which is, you know, making really yeah. clearly making fun of the U S government and military uh, pretty bold step to take. <laughs> yes, but also Kubrick. Kubrick was probably at his home in England, not caring what yeah, the Americans bring thought. It on. At all. <laughs> yeah, he was American, right? He just lives in England. He was. He right? was American, but for some reason, he he kind of got this house in the countryside in England and sort of lived there as not a recluse, but he spent most of his time at home in this house. Unless he was on set doing a movie, he just spent all of his years there uh he had like when he had to talk to actors and stuff he would uh, hire a helicopter to make them come there so he didn't have to go meet them at a studio or whatever so he he was a very peculiar wow. man yeah uh what's your uh, what's your tooth length review of the movie hugo uh if you haven't already said it yeah uh, i guess i would say on my letterbox review i said uh, that i was very wrong the first time i watched it and it's it's both as as infin- inf- infinity poignant as i thought it was the first time and absolutely hilarious completely agree good good call um i first saw this in college i want to say grizz i think it played at deepak it did which was a i didn't go see a it theater then, but <laughs> it was a theater on campus where grizz and i went to school um, yeah. Based on who I saw it with, it had to have been my junior or sophomore year, uh, probably my sophomore year, and uh, I loved it immediately, And which was surprising because I was like 20, and mm. like, you know, you're the barrier of entry for like a black and white movie from the 60s when you're 20 and just a little twerp like I was, yeah. probably a high barrier of entry, but I crashed through it and just immediately loved this movie, and I, I don't know, I've seen it off and on a lot in the last decade or so, uh, I got the DVD, um, one of my favorite Kubrick movies, and one of my favorite, I don't know if I'd say one of my favorite comedies because it's horrifying as we've discussed, yeah. <laughs> but you know, um, I'm just so in awe of it. Like every time I watch it, I'm so impressed and I feel like I pick up new things. And as we've discussed, like 
watching it in recent years kind of feels a little different than watching it in 2010 because I have a different opinion of our political leaders now than mm-hmm. I did 10 years ago. So um, it gets scary every year, but it also gets funnier every year for that same reason. Um, I don't know. It's awesome. Uh, shall we get into the plot? Because we can yes. dance around it a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to do a scene by scene thing. I just want to kind of talk about general That's broad great. strokes, which I feel like is pretty easy to do with a movie like Strange Love. It's it's a pretty you, you can cover the broad strokes pretty easily. So um, basically, like the the premise is uh, General Ripper, played by Sterling Hayden. He is this uh, general at this Air Force base, uh, Burpleson Air Force Base, which is a, a great name. <laughs> and all the names he, are uh, so good in this. They are, yes. At the start of the movie, General Ripper executes what's called Wing Attack Plan R. And then he shuts down Burbleson Air Force Base um, to the dismay of his group captain, Lionel Mandrake, played by Peter Sellers in one of his three roles in this movie. Uh, Wing Attack Plan R basically means he directs all the all the uh, strategic air command planes, all the SAC planes in the air to uh, bomb their targets in Russia. Uh, this this is actually a real thing, by the way, that the U.S. Air Force, like at the height of the Cold War, they had bombers in the air 24 hours times. a day yeah. at all times within two hours of their targets in Russia. At, at any time, they're always within two hours so that they could strike at a moment's notice. And um, so, that, again, that was a real thing that we did in real life. And in this movie, General Ripper, like basically tells all those planes, hey, there's been a nuclear attack in the United States. I'm in command now. So go retaliate. Um and quick, uh, I just want to mention one thing because you you mentioned Peter yeah. Sellers uh, playing three roles in this movie. Uh, he was paid one million dollars uh, for his performance in this movie, which made up fifty five percent of the overall budget. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and wow. Kubrick uh, was quoted to have said, and I'm, I I don't want to butcher it, but it was something along the lines of, "I got three for the price of six we <laughs> <laughs> talking about Peter Sellers in this movie. That's funny. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about this later, but he was supposed to play a fourth role, but uh, couldn't because he hurt his ankle. We'll, we'll get to that. Um, so as a provision of Plan R, basically what Plan R is, based on a real-life thing, which is uh, basically if there is a what's called decapitation strike, where like all the upper leadership of the United States government, i.e. the president and vice president, are killed in some kind of attack, then someone lower down the totem pole can authorize a nuclear strike. Um, mm. It's basically just a deterrent from attacking our top people in government because someone will still be there to be able to hit the red button and retaliate. Um, the show Designated Survivor came out a few years ago, basically covered the same territory where Kiefer Sutherland plays like the Secretary of Agriculture or something like that. And like, <laughs> yeah, like the State of the Union is bombed, so then he has to become president even though he was like 17th in line or something like that. Like, so Designated Survivor is also about, you know, plans the government has in place in case of a decapitation strike. Plan R is similar like that, where, again, it kind of leaves a chain of command in place. But the thing is, General Ripper is not supposed to execute Plan R unless, like, the president and vice president and speaker of the house are all dead, and they're not. So he is, uh, as as <laughs> as General Churchison says, I hate to judge before the facts are in. But it's beginning to look like General Ripper exceeded his authority. (laughs) 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 Just a great line. Um, And Peter is like, oh, you assured me that was impossible. (laughs) Well, sir, I don't think it's fair to condemn the whole program because of one slip up, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Just so great. That whole scene. So, okay, so after General Ripper executes the planes, as Hugo and I were just quoting, we cut to the war room, which is where President Merkin Muffley, again played by Peter Sellers, uh, has assembled all of his generals and all his advisors, including uh, General Turgidson, played by um, George C. Scott. And they basically discuss how can we recall these planes because um, the planes are instructed to switch the radios such that they can't receive any recall codes unless it's um, pr- uh, pr- uh, preceded. Has pro- proper three letter prefix. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't receive the, the radio signal. And only General Ripper knows the prefix. They can't contact the planes. And, and that's so that the Russians couldn't send them fake information. That's the Correct. reason they get for that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also, like, an actual thing. Probably. Like, when, like, under <laughs> certain, sure like, is. secret things happening in the Air Force, they would change the, the code group prefix such that the radios can only receive from, like, specific people who know those three letters. Uh, and the third place that the movie shows us is act, an actual bomber. Um, basically it's, a uh, Major TJ Kong played by Slim Pickens. He's the pilot of this B-52 bomber and we see him and his team like get the wing attack plan R instruction and they just prepare to 
hit their targets. So, like, basically the whole sequence on the plane is them, like, getting their supplies out and getting ready to, to nuke, the, nuke the Soviets. Nuclear combat, toe-to-toe with the Ruskies, as TJ Kong says. Um, so it's basically the movie jumps back and forth between those three things. Uh, the bomber, the war room trying to prevent the bombers, and uh, Burbson Air Force Base, which is where General Ripper kind of holes up and Mandrake tries to get him to, you know, call the planes back. Um, and then uh, we learn about halfway through the movie, I guess, spoilers, I guess, um, <laughs> we learn halfway through the movie that the Soviets have a doomsday machine that is programmed to go off if the USSR is attacked, uh, as explained by Dr. former Strangelove. Nazi scientists, now uh, a U.S. scientist, uh, Dr. Strangelove, also played by Peter Sellers. Um, so that's plot summary. Any any Anything I miss? I cover it all? Well, yeah. I think more or less, more or less. You, you cover the pro strokes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, out of curiosity, this isn't on the outline, but what, what do you guys... Uh, What's your favorite sequences? The the plane, the war room, or Purpleson? The war room. Great. What do you think? The war, war room. Is, yeah. is definitely the funniest. Yes. By far. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely <laughs> agree. Hugo? The war room is the funniest, for sure. But everything on the plane, I think, is is so amazing. Like, there's, yeah. there's that one scene where they take out the supplies, and he's like, oh, uh, a fellow could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas for all that stuff. Few things, few things there. Grizz, what do you got? Well, I think we're going to have the same thing. That line was actually redubbed. Yes, yes, it was. Yes. <laughs> Slim Pickens had said you could have a pretty good weekend in Dallas with mm. that. And then they, they. And you can see his mouth is making the. <laughs> he's saying Dallas clearly <laughs> on, on camera. Yes, they just dubbed it over. And why do they dub over, Grizz? I, I forget that. Why is it? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, it's because. Um, oh, no, I remember. About... I remember. I remember. Please, let okay, me. Okay, go let ahead. Me... It was yes. because. Uh, this was just after President Kennedy had been assassinated in Dallas. Right. So uh, two months before the movie came out, two months before the movie came out, the president was shot and killed in Dallas. So they thought, let's not have that reference in. Yeah. Let's change the city. <laughs> so they changed it to Vegas. Uh, yes. A couple other things on the plane stuff because I think this is fun. First of all, Darth Vader's up there. Yeah, James Earl Jones. This is his Jam- first James performance in a, a yeah. Oh. movie. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I did not. He know has. That. He has the last line of anyone in the plane. Hey, what about Major Kong? That's James Earl Jones. <laughs> um, third thing, uh, I guess we already talked about the, the set design, how the Air Force was like, how did you know? Yeah. How did you do this so good? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, fourth thing, uh, as legend goes, Stanley Kubrick did not tell Slim Pickens that the movie was a comedy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so Slim Pickens doing his, let's get on the hump. We got some flan to do. That voice is like him playing it straight. Like he thinks he's in a serious movie about like nuclear combat with the Soviets, uh, which in, in his defense, and uh, um, he, the people in the plane are the only people in the movie who never interact with either George C. Scott or Peter Sellers. So, like, I can kind of buy they wouldn't, like, know exactly what kind of movie they were in. Uh, go ahead, Grizz. What do you got? Well, so two things on that. One, uh, James Earl Jones, in an interview about this movie later, uh, said that uh, he, for decades after, he did not realize that Slim Pickens wasn't doing a character. And that was just how he talks. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought That's that was right. really funny. Uh, I- I think he was okay, like he was that, like a western surprise. star. Yeah, he's a western star. I think star. he was like a western star. Yeah. And and Kubrick very smartly just plucked him straight from his westerns and put him in the cockpit and filmed. Uh but and the result is great. The other thing was I I think that everyone in the in the bomber it's important to the the quality of the of the film and the message of the film that the people in the bomber don't realize they're in a comedy. Uh because yes. that that's what makes it so funny is that these stupid morons that are actually calling the shots are putting mm-hmm. these people who are taking things very seriously and trusting them that they're being given the correct information and before they go and do commit a, a war crime. Yeah. Uh, you know, so like it's important to the overall message that those people are, are very serious very about serious what they're and, doing and don't realize how ludicrous this whole scenario is. So last thing about that plane is uh, Peter Sellers was actually supposed to play tj kong it was supposed to be a fourth role but he i think hurt his ankle and so right. he couldn't like sit in the cockpit for extended periods of time so they did recast the role i wonder what that would have looked like um 
you know, a, a fourth role as, as this guy. Because, like you said, it's it's kind of, it's it's a fine line between you know, T.J. Kong is ridiculous, but he doesn't know he's being ridiculous. He thinks he's mm-hmm. playing it straight. And I wonder what like where the line would have been with Peter Sellers. I don't think it could have worked as well because Peter Sellers had to know that this is a silly situation because all the other characters he's playing are kind of silly. Yes. So okay. So I I was reminded of this, and this is important to talk about in the context of this movie. Roger Ebert, in his review of Doctor Strange Love, I think it was a year later review, um, mm. he said that a person wearing a funny hat isn't funny, but someone a person who's wearing a funny hat and they don't know that they're wearing a funny hat <laughs> that that is, is what's funny. So like that's I think an important distinction to make in Doctor Strange Love. Like T.J. Kong, like I said, is absolutely ridiculous and hilarious, but he doesn't know he's being ridiculous, and like that's the the disconnect is what makes it funny. It, like uh, the the famous line, "Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room." I love that so ironic much. funny line on the surface. Like it's an ironic funny line on the surface, but like the fact that he delivers that ro- line with absolutely no sense of the irony in what he's mm-hmm. saying, he delivers it completely straight. That's what makes it even more funny. Yeah, and like oh, yeah. basically everything with George C. Scott also like he's being this ridiculous animated character but he thinks he's being like a serious person and he's not and that's why the the, the, the contrast is where the comedy really comes from um where the satire comes from because it's like yes. the idea is all these people are very self-serious and they think of themselves as highly trained uh extremely competent but to the eyes of the outsider they're absolutely ridiculous i also yes. think george C. scott's performance in this uh is improved by him having been in Patton later. So it's not something they would have yeah. been able to appreciate when when Strange Love first came out, but us with, you know, hindsight, we we've all I'm sure we've all seen clips of George C. Scott playing General Patton and the mm-hmm. way he plays that general and then comparing it to the general Turgeson. he plays in this, Turgeson and yeah. you know, yeah. it adds to the humor of this movie for me, for sure. Yeah, uh, for context, in case anybody doesn't know what Grizz is talking about, uh, the movie Patton came out in 1970, one best picture, one best actor for George C. Scott, among the best acting performances of the 70s, I think is consensus. General consensus, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, and it opens very famously with him giving a speech in front of a giant American flag that I believe they parodied in Space Jam, if I remember correctly from our episode last <laughs> yes, week. that's so. correct. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> Um, let's actually just jump to the performances then, because, uh, I think George C. Scott is absolutely hysterical in this. Um, I, I love his introduction where, uh, he's on the toilet when he gets the call about the attack, um, on the special features DVD for Dr. Strangelove, they're just like interviewing, I think, a, a, a film critic or something, but he says that like, you know, if, uh, a man finds out that the, that nuclear, a nuclear attack is happening, if he finds out when he's in his office, the result is a, uh, documentary. If he finds out when he's in, when he's in his living room, the result is a social drama. If he finds out when he's in the bathroom, the result is a comedy. comedy. <laughs> so I think that's like a very, a very smart observation. And, you know, it's very telling to how Kubrick is, is pulling off this matter trick of a perilous apocalyptic political situation as a comedy. But like George e. Scott's intro where he's actually on the toilet when he finds out, I think it's like a good, um good intro to that but like uh the way he slaps his stomach tell you what you do old buddy yeah <laughs> and like <laughs> takes that phone call my is so good. favorite thing about his performance is how uh almost casual he is about the fact that yes. this bomber yes. is starting yes. and he yes. gets more like initially he's more interested in like the girl that he has waiting for him at home and yes. oh, of course no of course it's not just physical of course like he gets the phone call. <laughs> that, that's what he cares about in the war room that's what he that's what he cares about in the war room while they're trying to stop these planes but Yes. As it becomes more and more apparent that they're not going to be able to stop the planes, he gets almost. Well, we'll talk about this later. I'm sure, I'm sure you have this in the outline. Yes, it, it's, I do. Yes. He gets more and more, almost sexually aroused by the idea of just destroying the Ruskies and finding a yep. way to just absolutely yep. annihilate them. And we'll talk about that. His performance gets bigger and bigger, and everybody else in the war room, except for Peter Sellers, obviously, because he's the other character, is playing it completely straight and they're just looking at him like what are you talking about you insane man my favorite thing about george c scott's uh, performance in dr strange love is how animated he is like yeah. the way he yes. moves his head is i don't know it, it's very oh, yeah. and his eyebrows and his eyebrows it's like both very <laughs> serious and comical at the same time because you know mm-hmm. uh, it's you know very sudden and herky-jerky movements while he's having conversations. Yeah. And I think that adds uh, to the comedy a, a ton. 
I'm pretty sure when they're about to bring the uh, Soviet ambassador down to the war room, first of all, one of my favorite lines in the movie is, he'll, he'll see everything. He'll see the big board. He'll see the big board. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. But also, uh, a few moments later, when the ambassador is about to come down, uh, Turgeson, like gestures to the board and like falls over himself. Pretty sure that was in the script. I think George's guy just like just fell, fell down <laughs> and they just kept going. Um, but like you said, how animated he is. I, I, I agree that uh, he's great. Um, also, shout out to Sterling Hayden as General Ripper. I think he's awesome. And like, Grizz, to your earlier point, like if you only watch the first half of this, based on Sterling Hayden's performance, you kind of don't really know what kind of movie this is. Yeah. Because he speaks so... Like, when, when he gives that big speech to Mandrake about when we first hear the term precious bodily fluids he speaks with a cadence such that he's giving this big important speech and yeah. he sounds so self-serious and his, his cigar is so big yeah. in his mouth we'll, we'll talk about the cigar later but he's uh, he's embodying the type of protagonist 60s movies often had like this very self uh this very strong male character who speaks with uh, a lot of seriousness so you might not notice that, it, at least initially, that a lot of what he's saying is insane. It makes no sense at all. It feels like yes. he's being, he's, I don't know, the center of attention and he's saying something you should be paying attention to. But when you, when you realize what the movie is, you realize that everything he's saying makes no sense. And that's why, like, I think this... The movie's also very well edited, like when they mm -hmm. decide to jump between uh, location stuff. And to exactly your point there, Hugo, he gives this big, long speech. I can no longer allow the indoctrination, you know, blah, 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 blah. He ends that speech by saying, uh, and the, he, he mentions precious bodily fluids for the first time at the end of that speech. And then, like, the audience like, wait, what? He's what? giving this long, like, yeah. serious speech about, like, the communists. And then he says, did you just say precious bodily fluids? What? <laughs> then we cut <laughs> yeah. away. And we go back to the war room at that point. It, it takes a few minutes for like us to return to him and for him to elaborate on what the hell he's talking about, which turns out to be crazy talk. Um, yep. uh, so, okay, so shout out to Sterling Hayden, shout out to George C. Scott, but uh, Peter Sellers. Um, it, it, I, I, I like take for granted how good <laughs> this performance is because like when I first saw it, I, I don't know, like the three the three characters he plays, Mandrake, Merkin and Muffley, and Strangelove, they're so different. I like don't even like kind of... I don't even, like, realize it's the same person. Like, I, mm -hmm. I know intellectually that it is, but, like, I, I don't, like, see them as the same actor. I, you know, g given that the first time I watched it was, you know, the, the first half of the movie, and I got zero explanation of what I was going into or anything like that, I didn't notice that they were the same actor at all until yeah. <laughs> I, like, read about the movie later. <laughs> right. So his, um, his performance as Mandrake apparently is based on officers he encountered during his time. So he was actually with the RAF during World War II. So mm. he uh, basically based the Mandrake performance on people he knew while in the RAF. Uh, his performance as Merkin Muffley, President Merkin Muffley, is based on Adlai Stevenson. Uh, Adlai Stevenson was the Democratic candidate for president in 1952 and 1956. He lost to Eisenhower both times, but uh, that's who he was basing that performance on. Um, apparently... Uh, at first, Peter Sellers wanted Merkin Muffley to, like, have a cold to, like, emphasize mm -hmm. how weak he was as a person. But um, apparently it, it kind of got a little too ridiculous and too over the top. And as I read on Wikipedia, he would, like, the crew would laugh and he, <laughs> they would ruin takes because they were laughing so much. And so Kubrick pulled them aside and said, you know, you're kind of like the straight man at the center of this. You're kind of like the yeah. one serious character in this movie. So you kind of have to pull it back a little bit. But when we first see Merkin Muffley, he's like wiping his nose with a handkerchief and stuff in the handkerchief in his pocket. That's like a, a holdover from when Sellers was playing him with this big over the top, like ridiculous cold. So like, that's the, the one shot of that. Um, and lastly, Dr. Strangelove, who was not in the book red alert. This is a complete creation of the movie. Um, he's based on a number of people, but mostly on Herman Kahn, who is a nuclear strategist who I'll mention again later. And on, uh, Werner von Braun, who is a, a, you know, Nazi scientist, obviously, um, um among others. So uh, Who the eventually look of Strangelove became the you know most important scientist for the U.S. space program. So. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, the the character design, the look of Doctor Strangelove is apparently modeled after a character from Metropolis. I've not seen Metropolis, but like the uh, the, mm. the black glove and like the crazy hair. Apparently, that's based on this Metropolis character. Yeah, um, very prominent. I just read in the movie. As soon as you see it, as soon as you see Metropolis, you'll be like, oh yeah, there's Doctor Strangelove. 100%. Rot Wang is what mm -hmm. yeah, character's name, I guess. Um, 
I just read this past week that apparently Stanley Kubrick wore those black leather gloves on set so that he could handle the hot lights. And uh, Peter Sellers saw that and was like, wait, give me one of those because I think this will work. So he has the the one black glove for his Dr. Transloff character. Uh, the Nazi, Nazi hand, hand, I guess. Yeah, yeah his Nazi hand. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, I love the performances. I think that, uh, you know, I, I want to kind of shift gears and talk about the, the, the satire and the political commentary. But I think that the performances are kind of intertwined with that because, mm-hmm. you know, th- this is a a serious situation they're in, but like most of the comedy comes from the fact that like they're ridiculous people inside of a serious situation. Like the characters and the performances is really where the comedy kind of comes from. But, um, but also like, but the fact that he's making this serious situation into a comedy is like, kind of like a statement in itself, like a political statement itself, I think. Um, but backing up Kubrick initially wanted to make a serious nuclear drama. Um, like I, I, I heard I think this was on the, the like behind the scenes DVD extra was like he read like fifty books on nuclear war or something like that and like mm-hmm. just internalized all that and wanted to make a serious drama. But like as he was adapting Red Alert by Peter George, um, he like found out he found himself like throwing away entire scenes because he was afraid the audience would laugh at mm-hmm. this serious drama. So he's like he just kinda leaned into that and decided to make it a uh, nightmare comedy instead of a serious drama. Uh, Red Alert by Peter George. The book this is based on is not a comedy. Um, it's like a it's a, it's the serious version of the story. Um, I've not read Red Alert, but apparently, like everything in the book also happens in the movie. Like it's it's about a SAC commander who executes wing attack plan R outside of his own authority. The worm tries to stop them. The the United States and Soviets like collaborate in shooting down the planes to prevent them from hitting their targets. <laughs> Um, it. Uh, I feel like the serious version of this movie is just kind of pulp, and it is, it doesn't really have much to say. Yeah, it's just well, showing what might happen, but it's not. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the thing. I think is like the stuff that happens in Red Alert, as I kind of alluded at the top, like was all real stuff. Like wing, mm-hmm. something like Wing Attack Planar does exist. Uh, and like we do actually at the time we did actually have planes in the air at all times like a moment's notice away from sh- nuking Russia and that kind of stuff uh, and so like you know like you said Hugo the the book is kind of basically sh- saying hey look how insane it is that like this yeah. is our reality when this is a possibility you know that yeah. this kind of thing could happen like isn't that insane that we're like uh, you know that we're that this is the state of affairs that you know this is what the Cold War is, is doing um, but it's it you know that. It- what I'm saying is the, the the serious version of that story, it might not be criticizing, you know, both sides in the same way. Like it could just be yeah. a story of, oh, the evil Russians uh, and at the end it of the day, we have to destroy like a, them. And... It ended up like a Tom Clancy movie. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I'm sure that, that there's versions of this that you could make that is that still has the, 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 the edgy uh, for the time commentary, but I feel like making the choice of of turning this into a comedy is where you really nail the political commentary of of criticizing everyone because like this movie is essentially saying everyone involved in this is are horrible people who you know are measuring dicks uh, with atomic bombs and and really just uh, risking like points out how time, childish was, the Cold War is. Exactly. Like at the time, it was a, an honest fear that people had that this could legitimately happen, and it's just insane. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, real quick, the, the plots of the movie and the plots of the book they the plot points match entirely. It's just different tone, um, minus the ending. Uh, apparently, in the book, the uh, everything that happens in the movie happens in the book. I.e., like they can't recall the planes. They eventually are able to recall most of the planes, but one of them could not receive their signal because their uh, radio self-destructed. So um, in the book, uh, because they were the no, there was no way the Soviets were going to be able to stop that plane, uh, the president offers the Soviets uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey, and they'd be like, okay, you can nuke Atlantic City in exchange for us what, nuking wherever we're about to nuke you. So sorry about that. Tit for tat, you can have Atlantic City. But then... Um, the plane is unable to uh, bomb their target. So like crisis averted Atlantic city stays okay. And like the doomsday machine doesn't happen, but 
And Dr. Strange love, the bomb is dropped. Uh, so, I mean, Hugo, Hugo, you were kind of just getting into this, but, like, the, I, I agree with you, the fact that, like, because this is a movie about, like, a serious political scenario that was, like, not outside the realm of possibility of happening, um, I think that makes the, the comedy a lot more bold. You know, the <laughs> fact that, like, this this is a, 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 a comedy about, you know, a world-ending event that was, you know, basically not far off from happening. Like, do you guys know about uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis? What do you know about Absolutely. that? Absolutely, yeah. It, it was a moment that- where, uh, it was the moment where the Cold War got its closest to actually turning into nuclear warfare, where uh, basically the Russians wanted to put some missile bases, nuclear Cuba. missile bases in Cuba, and there was the American fleet sort of showed up uh, in the ocean and, and and wanted to prevent them to from coming. To deter them and from exactly, and that was the moment the where the war, the, the Cold War, escalated to you know, yeah. get it, it. It got the closest to actually becoming a war. And then, and then that's when the X Men came in and they prevented it. Yes, that's exactly what <laughs> happened. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't get the reference because I haven't seen the most recent X Men movie, so oh, I apologize. Yeah. X Men First Class. Check it out. <laughs> okay, I should check that out. Uh, so d- does the name Vasily Arkhipov mean anything to you guys? Not uh, no. Here, here's here's an anecdote from the Cuban Missile Crisis that I learned in the last few years. Um, so there was a submarine. I mean, there's a lot of Soviet submarines around Cuba at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and um, there was one submarine that was like, I think it submerged. And it was like too like too deep to like get radio signals. So like they hadn't heard from Moscow in several days. And um, there was U.S. Navy destroyers on the surface surrounding Cuba, like you just said, Hugo, and they were dropping depth charges, which are like, you know, little explosives that basically force submarines to uh, resurface Mm -hmm. because they wanted they they could tell their the U.S. Navy could tell their submarines down there and they just wanted them to identify themselves. And so they're putting depth charges around this new this uh, Soviet sub, which had nuclear missile capabilities on the sub. And. the Soviets on that submarine, again, hadn't heard from Moscow in several days, and now there's a U.S. Navy ship above them dropping explosive charges onto them. Mm-hmm. And so, like, they're not sure what's going on up there. And, like, maybe we've already had we've already started dropping bombs on each other. Maybe nuclear war has begun. And so they had to make a decision on the submarine to either resurface or shoot off their nuclear missiles, assuming that that's what the situation was. And this particular sub had to have, I think, a full consensus of, like, the three captains on board, or the three, like, officers on board had to all come to a unanimous conclusion. And two of the guys wanted to fire their nuclear bombs, and one guy did not. Uh, Vasily Arkhipov was the guy's name. And it's only mm-hmm. because he did not, he wanted to resurface and not fire the missiles, uh, did we avoid a nuclear combat with the Soviet Good Union. Good moral probably. compass on that guy. <laughs> yes. And after the fact, after the fact, you know, decades later, like, that wasn't known until decades later and after the fact this guy was credited as being like the guy who saved humanity basically Mm -hmm. so the fact that that event everything i described that happened 15 months before the movie came out like how close we actually came to nuclear combat like you can't joke about this you know like (laughs) comedy equals tragedy Tragedy plus plus time time. there was no time kubrick just made this a comedy but like kubrick is making the 9-11 comedy he's making the iraq war comedy He's making a comedy where, like, 20 million American civilians being killed is, like, you know, that's mm-hmm. thrown out there as, like, a, a good scenario from yeah. General, General Turgidson. Um But, like, the fact that he's, like like you said, Hugo, he's pointing out the inherent ridiculousness of, like, the United States and Soviet Union's foreign policies. They're, it's they're also, decades it's also long showing foreign policies. how so easily uh, a set of circumstances might happen where the system that is designed to prevent nuclear strikes from starting might not work. And it's yeah. not that far-fetched at all that one general would just lose it and, and go on his own to do this. It, it yeah. feels like, as ridiculous as the characters are, the scenario, it feels very possible and realistic. Especially given what we know of, you know, especially, I don't know about other world militaries, but in the U.S. military, you know, soldiers follow orders you know, Mm -hmm. very strictly. And so if your general tells you to shut down all communications in the base and you don't listen, well, you're going to be arrested and court-martialed and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, so it it is not unreasonable to think that they'd be like, okay, well, you know, why would the general lie about this? Go ahead and shut down 
communication. And I'm, Let's get ready and to I'm shoot sure anybody many, who comes at our base. And I'm sure there are many stories throughout history of, of generals going rogue and, and choosing to do something that is outside uh, what that of the chain of command and that doesn't follow what the political leaders want. Um, and it just so happens that at the time, the capability these generals had was to launch a nuclear strike that would have annihilated, you know, countries. Yep. So, yeah, it, it's it's pretty scary. And to use comedy to point how how flawed that system is, is is just a stroke of genius, I think. Yeah. I, I'm sure like I'm sure the movie had a lot of backlash upon release. Right. I don't know, actually. I've, I haven't I haven't found anything about that, but I would expect, uh, you know, it's not for best picture, you know. Yeah, I but I would expect you know yeah, the, that's the, the in government. That's Hollywood, man. They're going to be able liberal to know. Hollywood. Yeah, <laughs> the real America. Like I'm sure the military um, wasn't very happy about this movie. Well, they the Air Force had them put up that disclaimer at the yeah. in the opening title card, which is, "Hey, this despite what you're about to see, don't worry, this won't happen." Is basically mm-hmm. what that title card says in the Air Force. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you, Hugo. That uh, like, and what, what what you're both saying actually is like, it it's not like that implausible like what happens in the movie no. like that's something that i noted uh not this most recent rewatch but the rewatch a couple years ago is like it's like uncomfortably plausible actually yeah. and like as i was watching i kept waiting for the moment that was like a little too ridiculous or like a plot point that's a little too far-fetched and like there's really not much far-fetchedness yeah the only actual this, far-fetched the thing is the doomsday device which is that even that far-fetched you know i'm not sure uh, but it's like I mean, compared to the rest a device that like can't be stopped Mm-hmm. And once it's triggered, well, no, that that seems a little far fetched. I I think that someone would be like, no, we should probably have a fail safe. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, I was going to say because uh, we haven't talked about it yet, the the movie ends you know differently than how it was originally shot. The uh, yes original ending was that the war room was going to break out into like a pie fight, like throwing food at yes. each other, and yes, yes. Kubrick decided that was too farcical, uh, and you know would take away from the satire. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, <laughs> that's, I, but, I appreciate that decision. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, but I do want to talk about like the actual ending instead uh, for basically in regard to the satire, like you just said, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about the doomsday machine. Hugo, you okay. just said it was kind of a little bit far fetched. However, uh, Herman Kahn, who was one of the basis, one of the bases of Dr. Strangelove mentioned him earlier, uh, he was a uh, basically like a nuclear strategist for the Rand Corporation. Um, shouted out in this movie as the Bland Corporation, as Dr. Strangelove says. Um, <laughs> but Herman Kahn came up with the Doomsday Machine as like a rhetorical thought experiment, as a criticism of mutually assured destruction. That's basically, in his mind, mutually assured destruction taken to its logical conclusion is something like the Doomsday Machine. Right. And he wrote a book called On Thermonuclear War that kind of talked about all this. And he was also a consultant on this movie but uh in his book on thermonuclear war he said quote i used to be wary of discussing the concept of a doomsday machine um for fear that some colonel would get out a general operating requirement or development planning objective for the device so basically he like didn't really want to talk about it too much he thought people would be like hey good idea i do that yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah. um but yeah i guess i guess it is kind of ridiculous but again to his point it it is also kind of just taking mutually assured destruction to its net to its net logical conclusion which is why you know this is this is a great satire because it, it takes like the existing policies yeah. and kind of just points out their inherent ridiculousness by kind of showing you like hey this is what you're this is what you're advocating here like this doomsday machine this is this is what you're talking about more or mm-hmm. less so and it's good also idea like, with with the real realism like doomsday machine aside I think what's what's really great about how realistic the movie feels is that there's no if you think about the story as a whole it might sound a bit much a bit far-fetched but the movie does a good job at having little moments of escalation where something else goes wrong some other little thing goes but the the radio gets shot out uh the codes you can't get the codes because only he has the codes and you know the mandrake fans out what the codes are but you know he can't no get one, on the phone with no the president fast enough him, like because he's british no one will believe him he's <laughs> there's, there's little moments of escalation where the situation gets more and more desperate that fe- that makes all of it feel more realistic than it that it even might be. Yeah, yeah. Th- those small escalations are all believable. Exactly. You know? And and like you know, that that's why like the movie's kind of so scary is because like mm-hmm. the things that go wrong they're not like 
crazy far-fetched things. Yeah, like, they, like they, you go into it, Russian it goes, territory, you're going to get shot yeah. at, and it's possible that it hits your radio. Yeah, the th- the things that go wrong go wrong slowly. It's mm-hmm. not like one. I mean, General Ripper, General Ripper executing Plan R is a big thing, but like everything beyond that is it, it's just pushing the ball forward just enough that you're like, okay, yeah, I kind of buy that, mm-hmm. and then that ends with eventually the entire planet being uh, killed, more or less, in a <laughs> nuclear attack. Which, which, as uh, you said, is a different ending from the book as well, right? Yeah. Yes, in the in the book, the the plane that basically the. General uh, Major Kong's plane is unable to drop their payload, mm-hmm. and so crisis averted in the book. Um, but that would not be in lining in line with what Kubrick was trying to say. So he changed the ending to make that happen. Um, which brings me to my last thing on the outline, which is like the um, y- yes, this, there's like political satire here and political commentary, but I think that the biggest part of the satire is the psychosexual stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Hugo, you mentioned earlier that. This movie says that the Cold War basically was a dick measuring contest, and I yeah. think that this movie would 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 agree. You know, um, from the uh, there's a lot of phallic imagery oh, all yeah. over the movie, including the uh, amazing opening title sequence. Yes, which uh, the opening title sequence is it, it wasn't actually shot for the movie. It's it's like archival footage that uh, the editors just kind of grabbed and, and inserted. But it is a KC thirty five tanker refueling a B fifty two mid air, and it again. You know the the tanker has to. It's very it's very penetrative imagery. Oh, yeah. It's like the planes are having sex, and it's not like it's not subtle either. Like the very mm-hmm. uh, opening images, the the opening opening image is like flying over clouds, and like some mountains are kind of poking through the clouds. But the second image we see in the movie is a giant phallus of the KC thirty five about to uh, refuel the B fifty two, and um, the inside the plane just to really put the nail on the head with the sexual energy of this, the pilot of the bomber is reading through a pornographic magazine. A Playboy magazine, yes. <laughs> also, the uh, the woman he's looking at in the magazine, Miss Foreign Affairs, that's actually Miss Scott, uh, yep. the secretary that Georgie Scott is with uh, <laughs> when we cut to him. Speaking of which, um, Hugo, you alluded to this earlier, but like when... General Turgeson, George C. Scott's character, gets the call about what's happening. He's like, you know, basically in bed with his with his lady friend, mm-hmm. and she says, "Bucky, I'm not tired either." As he's about to go into the war room, and he like implies that they'll like you know bone when he gets back. Yeah. So like he's probably pretty horned up as he even just walks into the war room. <laughs> and then to make things worse, she calls him while he's in there, as Hugo alluded, and he's he says one of my favorite lines, which is, "Of course, it's not only physical. I deeply respect who's a human being, but." <laughs> Again, she's basically kind of reiterating his horniness while he's in the war room. And um, very shortly after she re- reiterates his horniness, as Hugo alluded, he um, proposes the all out nuclear strike. And that's kind of the movie's kind of tying those two ideas the fact that he's kind of getting horned up at the prospect of nuking the nuking the Ruskies, and, as Hugo and said. Even once they accept that the doomsday device is going to go off, uh, it, they turn to Dr. Strangelove, who explain this whole explains this whole scenario of how society is going to survive for 100 years but they're also going to be able to outsmart the ruskies even in that like even once we have nuclear catastrophe and we're going to be in a hole in the ground for 100 years we still have to find a way to outsmart them and we can't it have a into mine this... gap <laughs> no mine it, shaft mine gap, shaft yeah. Gap. Yeah. <laughs> and it turns into this creepy thing where they decide that all the women shall have to be very attractive and there shall be a ratio of 10 women for one man and every man shall have to do a lot of children it's the plan to repopulate the earth is yeah yeah, they'd have to have 10 women to one man and general turgeson is very uh gung-ho about that plan because as he says would that mean we'll have to do away with the so-called monogamous sexual relationship, at least as far as men are concerned? Uh, good point, Buck. <laughs> good point, um, Buck. <laughs> I want to talk about that, but before we get to that, real quick, uh, General Ripper's cigar. Um, mm-hmm. As I kind of mentioned earlier, when he gives his first speech about like why he's doing this, uh, he's shot from a low angle, very like reverent, and he's got this big, long cigar that kind of stretches across the frame, and uh, he barely takes it out of his mouth. He, he talks with it in his mouth. And then, like, an hour later, as he's, like, defeated, the base is, you know, recaptured, and he's about to go shoot himself, his cigar, his cigar's a lot shorter and stubbier. Mm-hmm. And if you're talking about phallic imagery, that's, like, a visual representation of his, like, loss of virility. And uh, 
in between these two moments, he talks to Mandrake about like why he nuked the Soviets, why he <laughs> did this. And it's basically because he believes they are poisoning the water supply more or less with and making <laughs> yes with fluoride <laughs> and uh he as he tells mandrake he first came to this conclusion after quote the physical act of love because a supreme tiredness came over him so <laughs> basically general ripper was tired after sex and his first thought was i must be being poisoned by the ruskies let's nuke them i don't even know <laughs> like, so, like, i also i feel like what they're hinting at is not only that he was tired after sex he was tired doing sex and wasn't yes, able to, to perform he was impotent. yes I, I think that's what they're going for like it's it's showing all these uh military leaders who are really doing everything just because they want to affirm their masculinity and virility against the ruskies correct um i do not i do not avoid women mandrake but i do not deny them my essence uh, mm-hmm. great line also, from Sterling. i also think it's interesting where he's the most masculine character in the movie well, yeah. on the other hand, Mandrake is the most effeminate character in the movie, at least according to traditional, you know, masculinity standards. He Absolutely, speaks with yeah. this very soft, uh, posh British accent. He's a shorter man. He's, you know, he has these very perfect, uh, this very perfect moustache that yeah. he keeps. He he falls under pressure pretty pretty badly. He falls under pressure pretty badly. Yeah. Just his demeanor is is very very much gives off a more feminine energy compared to Ripper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very good call. Mandrake's like low key, I think the unsung hero of this movie. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously he's like the literal hero because he hero like learns how to recall the planes, but also like <laughs> I, I I always kind of overlook him. Yeah. In this, but he's he's great and and uh, Peter. Sellers I, I think it's because awesome. he's in terms of Peter Sellers' performance in the movie. Mandrake is his least hilarious performance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Certainly in comparison to you know the president on the phone, and then yes. of, <laughs> of course Doctor Strangelove being you know comically animated and his you know nazi hand he can't control and all that stuff yeah so mandrake falls flies a little under the radar <laughs> yes uh speaking of the the phone call this this isn't necessarily like a psychosexual thing but like the fact that like the president and the russian premier like get into a pissing contest on who's more sorry that mm-hmm. this is happening uh don't say you're more sorry than me i'm just as capable as being sorry as you are dimitri uh that's again kind of speaks dimitri. to <laughs> yeah <laughs> The, the, the fact that th- this kind of ties in with like the fact that George C. E. Scott learns that a nuclear attack is happening while he's in the bathroom, the fact that the Russian premier finds out while he's drunk. Yeah. And so the, the, the president has to like talk down to him. Like he's talking to a toddler. <laughs> it's like so freaking funny to me. <laughs> that's why that's one of the better, one of the better scenes. Um, real quick though, other psychosexual imagery. I've mentioned all the phallic imagery. Uh, Major Kong riding the bomb yeah. down to the down to a down to a uh nuclear orgasm as other people have called it but like that's the image that very I very phallic on, imagery on show yeah. right now because that yes was very most good emblematic it's the clearest yes. phallic imagery of the movie <laughs> yes yes well i honestly i would argue that the the planes in the opening sequence might be more phallic also yeah. uh general ripper general ripper when he gets his giant gun out of his golf bag and puts it on the table at crotch height yeah and then <laughs> later is like shooting it holding it at crotch height again it's, it's not not very subtle what, what they're doing but uh, a lot of that um and then finally the uh as he alluded or one of you alluded that the post-war tunnels plan which was yeah. all right to survive this there's a nuclear half-life of 93 years which means the population has to go underground for 100 years let's choose you know only the our military leaders and whatever like virile men we have and then 10 women who and can of course, sexually they'll have to tantalize be, the men they'll enough. Have to be yeah, very attractive in order to motivate that'd be very attractive. So and that'd be way, stimulating, stimulating a sexual that nature or something he like that. Says yeah, it, it's Doctor Strange Love being extremely sleazy and gross oh, yeah. about it's, it. It's which creepy is as well. Get out. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's it's not even just sleazy and gross. It's like Nazi e. You know, yeah. that's what, I mean. He's basically proposing a plan where, like, let's bring our let's choose. Which small segment of the population yeah. we will allow to live on and repopulate the earth? So like, oh, yeah. it's a very kind of eugenics-y, genocide-y yes. kind of plan. No and no. there's no, qu- it's not an accident that as he's proposing this plan, his hand does inadvertent Nazi salutes, and he accidentally mm-hmm. calls the president Mein Führer because the Nazi in him is like coming out as he gives this Nazi-ish proposal. Yeah. After all, the Nazi the plan of how the population of the earth will be is coming to fruition for him. So. It's also, less, his, yeah, whole character, right. his whole character is kind of strangely uh, in the background of the movie, if you, could, if you think yeah. the fact he that doesn't the movie... Know, he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't even say a word till halfway through. 
Yeah, and the movie is called Doctor Strange Love. Um, yeah, which I, I thought was interesting. But I, his character is basically pointing out that just the hypocrisy of of the American military military and government, where you know, next enemy, we're just going to find the best people of the last enemy, and uh, in order to fight them, and which is kind of prescient as well, because it's like when you get into discussions today about, oh, well, yeah, but the US also armed a lot of groups in the Middle East because they wanted to fight the communists. And it, it, there's sort of a cyclical uh, thing that the movie is able to portray even before it happens again Precious. after World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. It's very smart. Also, it's also very funny. Uh, you know, the, the way that... Funny. Yeah. The way his hand, like, attacks himself, I think, is always very funny. And uh, <laughs> there's a moment where, like, his right hand is kind of dangling limp, mm-hmm. and he, like, starts hitting it. He starts beating mm-hmm. his own hand. Uh, if you look in the background, the uh, Russian ambassador is, is breaking. He's breaking. Like, he's starting to, like, yeah. la- he's laughing at Peter Sellers because <laughs> he's just, like, in a crowd of people just beating his own arm. It's very funny. It's so funny specifically because they don't acknowledge it. It just happens. He doesn't know his hat is funny. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't know his hat is funny. None of the other funny. characters do even acknowledge it at all. It just happens, and it, it's just brilliant. I, I don't even know how to yes. describe how smart that idea is. Yeah, but I, I would argue that the very, very final moments of the movie are also with the uh, virility, mm-hmm. psychosexual stuff, the way that Strangelove, the, the final line is Strangelove stands up, takes a few steps, and says, Mein Fuhrer, I can walk. Uh, he's getting so excited at the possibility of having this tunnel system where they'll have 10 women to one man and mm-hmm. all the women will be sexually tantalizing and in nature. That he, and, you know, all the- yes, that he stands up out of his wheelchair and takes a few steps. That's how like jazzed he is about this yeah. idea. So um, again, I think that's kind of the final button. And like mm-hmm. Grizz, what, what, the reason I brought all this up is like you said that a pie fight would not really be in keeping with the satire. Yeah. And so ending it here gives the movie a different button, different point. And like ending it on that point, I think really highlights the virility. Especially since stuff with the rest of the movie about. has been like, you know, it's very clear has been setting up this dick measuring contest. Exactly. The entire yeah, yeah, movie yeah. ending it yeah. on the pie fight. While that I'm sure would have been humorous to watch. Isn't the, the punchline of the movie. So th- this ending is absolutely perfect given the setup. Yeah. And especially with what happens immediately following him standing up and, and proclaiming, you know, I can walk. Uh, everyone's blown up. <laughs> yeah, we, we cut to a bunch of foot, footage of footage of bombs going off and uh, we'll meet again starts playing over it, which is a great ending. It's so good, especially because of how just jarring the cut is. Yeah, it's a very like, jarring that cut. That yeah. doesn't feel like the final line of a movie, but it is. And it cuts, and we just see the imagery and the song, and then the movie's over. And it, and the bombs go on for a while. Like, yes, <laughs> they do. Yeah, before the credits start to roll. Yeah, uh, I guess I should say that uh, Ebert. Another thing he said about it is that he doesn't like that the movie continues after the major Kong bomb goes off. So basically, this whole scene with the mine shafts and all that stuff, he thinks that like the movie should end with that initial bomb drop. But like, I, I think that like. That's kind of he's kind of right. He's kind of got a point that like the the movie kind of reaches a natural conclusion at that point, but it goes on for another, like five minutes. Mm-hmm. And so for that reason, I kind of pay attention more to these five minutes, and like I kind of pay attention to like what point he's making. And so like that's why I think that like he included this is even though it's not really the natural end point, like he really wanted to drive this point home about like the dick measuring contest of it all, mm-hmm. and like the you know, and mind even just the and all that how little these people care for the destruction of the world. Yes, that's and what, what I think. they yes. actually yes. care about perfect. is winning, which is yes, why exactly. it, it just drives exactly home right. that message that the yeah. movie has been building to. Even though, like, I agree, I, I agree it's not perfect in terms of pacing, because the natural end point does feel like it would be when the first drop bomb gets dropped. And And it's not just winning in terms of a war winning, it's Winning in that they're going to have a whole bunch of women in their minds. Yes. Yeah. That's what's the most important thing to them. And mm-hmm. just to right. put the nail on the head, that's what's been important to them all along. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to make you Mrs. Buck Turgidson. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I love this movie. Are you guys ready to rank it? Let's rank yes. it. Uh, I'll, I'll say up front, uh, this is going to be my uh, number one. I, I would put this as number one as well, uh, based on our list. It's it's not even my favorite Kubrick film. No, I me neither. Think, no, it's not. But um, just, 
you know, I, I think based on our list, it, it's absolutely fair to put it at number one. Based on, based on how fun it is, how crazily well it's aged, and yeah. how, like, how bold it is, like, mm-hmm. it, it kind of going hand in hand. Number one, it's aged well, but also, like, how crazy it is that they released a comedy like this in 1964 yeah. at the height of the Cold War, you know? So those two things in, in, in conjunction, like, it's definitely number one for me. And it's also, uh, I, don't, I said this about um, when we were talking about Trial of the Chicago 7, I, I said that movie is very uncynical about things that mm-hmm. I'm very cynical about. And this movie, Doctor Stranger, Date of Strange Love, is extremely cynical about things that I am extremely cynical about. So it yeah. really fits right into my, I guess, worldview as well. So... So this is my favorite Kubrick movie. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I did truly love it. Uh, my conflict is that in terms of our list, there are movies that I like better. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, just as a recap, our top 10 currently, It's a Wonderful Life, 9, Citizen Kane, 8, The Thing, 7, Lawrence of Arabia, 6, The Departed, 5, Boogie Nights, 4, Shaun of the Dead, 3, Paddington 2, 2, Silence of the Lambs, and number 1 currently, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, Thank you for recapping. Yes. So... For me, I originally I came in thinking like I I like Lawrence of Arabia better, uh, but mm-hmm. looking at some of the movies that are ahead of it, I I like this better than some of the movies that are ahead of Lawrence of Arabia. So I think I originally I was going to put it below Lawrence of Arabia. Now I I would put it at number three after our discussion. So I think that would mean that it would average out to still being number one overall. <laughs> So you're putting it well, at, ahead of Patty 2 behind Silence of the Lambs. Behind Silence of the Lambs and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So it'd be number two? Yeah, I guess it would right. go at number two, yeah. Okay, well then it's All right, number two so spot. Let's do number two. Yeah. Ferris Bueller, cool. holding on strong. So Ferris Bueller is not unseated by... All right, we got two comedies up at the top. Yeah. We like comedies. Really? <laughs> we like comedies. Our top five is really comedies now. We got Ferris Bueller's... Oh, not Sons of the Lambs. Well, no, Sons of the Lambs is very much not a comedy. It's a comedy. It's very so of our comedy. Comedy. Uh, <laughs> Four of our top five are comedies. This is cool. Yeah. Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Doctor Strange Love, Sons of the Lambs, Panton 2, Shaun of the Dead. We also happen well, to cool. just pick some of the best comedies. So well, yes, of course. I guess that's why. They're worth remembering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. What are we remembering next speaking, week? <laughs> yes, speaking of which, uh, next week... Another uh, comedy. Kind, kind of a comedy. Of. I mean, yeah. well, I'll be curious to see what you guys think of it. But uh, in honor of James Gunn releasing The Suicide Squad uh, coming up, I thought it'd be fun to go back to his first directorial debut, which was uh, Slither from 2006. Um, and also, just full disclosure up front, uh, I happened to go to the same high school that James Gunn went to in St. Louis, and I was in a film class in the fall of 2007, so shortly after Slither was released. So James Gunn came to our film class and like talked to us about Slither in 2007. So like, I thought that was like the coolest thing that ever happened, so that's probably a reason why I really dig this movie still 15 years later, but uh, we'll see what you guys think of it. But I just want to disclose that information, that I have some insider reasons to enjoy the movie Slither. But I do. I think it's great. So I'm looking forward to it. I do like James Gunn for some of his other movies, like Guardians of the Galaxy. Sure. Or, you know, of course, some of my I love Guardians, yeah. For the MCU. Yeah, but yeah. of course. Uh, you can find me at Good Game Grizz on Twitter. I would love if some people would follow me on Twitter, because then you'll also get updated on when I'm doing stuff on Twitch, which is also Good Game Grizz. <laughs> what about you, you Hugo? There you go. Uh, you can find me at Hugo uh, underscore Pinai on Twitter. And you can find my other podcast, I'm So Tired, which came back after a bit of a hiatus there. And uh, latest episode, we talked about Loki, uh, Black Widow, and the future of the MCU. So if you're into that, check it out. And yeah, a lot of people are into that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Brosh Jadley. I think I'm on Letterboxd too, but I don't, I don't really know. Um, and uh, my YouTube channel is Moves I Love, So Can You. Also, I probably should have pitched it at the top, but uh, I have a video on Dr. Strange Love that I made oh, nice. two-ish years ago. Um, so most of the stuff I talked about here is based on my research and stuff that I said in that video. But check that out, uh, Dr. Strange Love video. I did also forget. I, I wanted to mention I'm on another show on YouTube. Pop XP uh, is the n- name of the channel. It's Pop the XP. Week in Pop. I want to shout that out because we talk about a variety of movies and TV. It's all like, you know, some current stuff mixed with some hidden independent gems that uh, you may have missed. A lot of cool stuff on there. You should check us out on there as well. Check out Pop XP and also check out Remember the Film next week as we discuss Slither. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. Bye.